Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our event. This is the Internet Governance Project at Georgia Tech, and we are today discussing a very interesting issue of the um, it's fundamental to Internet governance, and that is, of course, the Internet has succeeded because it created global compatibility among data communications at a critical time in the evolution of information technology uh, in the early 80s when we were just getting lands and personal computers and the process of networking was being democratized and the internet protocol succeeded in creating an unprecedented degree of openness and uh, participation in global networking. But that was a very long time ago. That was um, more than, uh, well, about 40 years now almost. And um, in that time, uh, we've seen four generations of mobile communications, telecommunications technology. We've seen massive upgrades in computer capability. And at the same time, we've seen an attempt to improve and upgrade the internet standard, namely IPv6, uh, which has had uh, a gradual and very slow uh, diffusion. So we're here today. We have two uh, distinguished experts in basic networking protocols. We have uh, Dr. Richard Lee of FutureWay Technologies. In, uh, he's in California. And we have Andrew Sullivan. Uh, who is the president and CEO of the Internet Society. And uh, we will have basically four parts to our discussion today. Uh, first, we're going to discuss what the problem is, what, whether we need new IP or not. Then we're going to discuss some technical details about the, the differences in protocols and architectures. And we're going to talk about standardization venues. And finally, we're going to talk about the impact of these initiatives on global internet governance generally. Now, in terms of questions, we would like to go through those four uh, parts of the discussion first and then open it up to questions. If you want to ask a question, um, then please indicate that in the chat. I don't think we have a hand raised function in BlueJeans events. Uh, and my colleague, Brendan Kerbis, who's uh, one of the principals at the Internet Governance Project here at Georgia Tech, will try to keep track of who wants to ask a question. And we will upgrade you and invite you to turn on your microphone when that time comes. So let's get started. Richard, why do we need the new IP? What problem does it solve? Uh, what makes current upgrades uh, that have been happening at the IETF for 20 years, uh, what makes those inadequate? And what's the, what's the point behind this whole initiative? Hello, everyone. Hello, Milton, Andrew. I'm Richard Lee. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. And it's a huge question and uh, uh, because the answer um, is not that simple because and we worked on this since 2015, only the five years work. And uh, we like start to publish in um, 2017. Uh, okay. So everybody knows that, and uh, I totally agree, not deny. Uh, internet is a very successful technology. And perhaps the most successful technology ever invented over our times, it has created millions of jobs and billions of dollars of business and uh, we are benefit from it and it looks like looks like that at least i believe it's an engine of a current and temporary economic growth but not everybody every sector uh, benefits from the success of the internet the success of the internet looks limited to the information technology, communication technology, also called ICT. There are still many other networks and applications that have not been connected to the internet yet. For example, operational technology, 
or OT. OT is different from ICT in the sense that the information exchange between two points need to be done under certain KPI requirements. KPI is uh, typically used in some communication technology like uh, latency, pack loss, throughput, and a few others. And uh, uh, for some OT, they normally talk about dependability, like reliability, availability, uh, integrity, maintainability, and security. So, and, and uh, like latency, pack loss are part of it. Uh, so, when you send a control, for example, uh, in factory, when you send a control command, let's say to stop a robot, if the command is too late, the robot may do some harm to its environment. There were some examples. So especially in 3GPP, uh, there were extensive uh, technical specifications and the technical reports on that. So KPI metrics such as latency and the pack loss ratio must be guaranteed for OT networks, right? But currently, OT networks and applications and devices and protocols, it appears that right now they are rough in roughly the same state of development and deployment that the IT was in the 1990s. There were 10 to 20 industrial protocols in use, and none of them is dominating the market. And some of them are not even digitized. They are still using analog signals, not digitized. The biggest market share uh, is even less than 15%. Maybe it has been changed. I don't, I have not followed up. At least uh, uh, as of last year, the biggest market share is 15%. And there are about 10 protocols here uh, in use. And mostly are proprietary or in one sector, right? So in order to expand the internet, I mean the scope of the internet, so that we want to converge IT, CT, and OT. And uh, so, so that's, uh, we need to see if the current IP works or not. So we did some research and some experiment. Uh, we found that uh, current IP uh, is not capable of meeting the KPI requirements. So that is a problem we want to solve. So we want the internet to be a truly pervasive and ubiquitous uh, network that will converge all the IT, CT, and OT together. So that is the first problem we want to solve. Okay, Let's good. good. Uh, Richard, um, yeah. let, me, uh, let me invite Andrew to come in now and um, respond to that. So I hear you saying that fundamentally you're concerned about OT and IT convergence and that there are uh, simply networks and applications that really don't work well or won't work well um, going forward. So, uh, Andrew, what do you have to say about that? Uh, well, uh, th thanks, first of all, uh, for uh, for hosting this. The, the thing that I would say about it is that we're sometimes confusing some layers here. So this isn't really just IP that we're talking about, but actually a whole suite of protocols with IP kind of in the core of it, um, uh, because IP is pretty thin, right? Um, uh, but I understand why that shorthand is being used. So, like, you know, that's really a, a rhetorical point rather than a, a, a serious technical point. The, the, the deeper question um, is whether, uh, whether these are really internet applications uh, or, or not, uh, because that's actually part of the question. The, the, the basic idea here is that, is that we're looking for convergence. And one of the questions is whether people actually want to converge. Um, some of the applications that we're talking about are designed not to use the internet on purpose, right? They're avoiding uh, uh, internet uh, communications because they're deeply conservative uh, industrial sectors that want to avoid uh, that kind of environment. 
And so it, it's not clear really whether the demand is there, whether this convergence is something that people really want to do or whether that is something that is really valuable from the point of view of the users uh, of the technologies. Now, then we have the question of you know, what the use cases are where, uh, where, the, uh, where the users of that technology really do want that convergence. Uh, and then the question is exactly, uh, as Richard laid out, I think, what are the, uh, what are the constraints um, uh, for, for those use cases? And I think, I think there's no question uh, that we've seen cases where the traditional network stack um, that, um, that built the internet uh, doesn't work very well. The obvious example of this is, is interplanetary um, networks. Uh, where we've actually developed, you know, a whole alternative uh, sort of mechanism for uh, for those communications um, involving delay and uh, and disruption tolerance, because you know if a moon gets in the way, then your signal goes away, and so you've got to you've got to have a mechanism to recover that. So that's a great example of where a bunch of research happened to ha had to happen in order to understand. Okay, here we've got these use cases. Uh, the traditional IP stack doesn't work for us. So what are we going to do instead? And I think that it's entirely appropriate that if we've got these very specific use cases, we try to work on what the gaps are, what is the analysis that needs to be done in order to understand what problems it is we're trying to solve. And then we're in a position um, to, uh, to decide, hey, is this really an extension of internet protocols? Is this a new kind of protocol that um, needs to be built up an entire new stack? Do we need a new generation or what? And I think that gap analysis is, is actually one of the things that is, is perhaps one of the biggest issues that we really need to confront in order to decide what the right uh, approach is. Very interesting. So um, Richard, in some ways, he's suggesting that the whole uh, idea of calling this new IP was maybe a, a bit of a mistake uh, or, or an overreach, or do you, do you think we really need to talk about a new IP or sort of a a migration to a new generation, or, or are you talking more about a niche uh, development of protocols more suited to OTIT? Okay, so um, first, uh, like short answer to yours, and whether it should be called a next generation or not, uh, that's not super important question, actually. Just the name, actually, I really do not care. But uh, going back to Andrew's and, uh, and comments and opinions, Actually, I kind of agree with him, and uh, but uh, I like to add some, like give some follow up. So I'm hearing that from what Andrew said that I, which I agree. Actually, there are two problems or issues here, and as correctly analyzed by him, the first is that do we want to converge DT and the internet or not? Right. So uh, that's my understanding. Assuming we want, can we do it with the internet or not? If we want to do it, how can we do it, right? So these are like two like a question here. The first question, like do we want it? Uh, it's not going to be decided by me or somebody else, but it appeals to me because like from the, especially in 3GBB, I don't remember that number, like a technical report and all technical specifications, and uh, they really want to empower the OT domain there. But what they do is that only in the very small segment of the network, there is a radio access network. But we know that radio access network, and that in order to make the world, you need to connect the base station, or so-called G node B or GNB, to the core network. So this part actually, Right now, carriers and service providers are using internet. So in 4G, like a MPoS VPN, uh, is widely uh, used to connect the base station and the core network here. So if we change the topic, let's say how we like uh, like expand or improve how, or how to make that part to support such requirements that are like uh, agreed in the in the industry and uh, in 3GBP body. So how can we do it? So here, I agree with uh, Andrew, here we have two questions. The first is, do we really want like an internet to be a convergence technology for ICT and OT? If we want it, how can we do it? So the new IP here actually is already made an assumption 
suppose we want it, and then how can we do it? That's my follow up to uh, Andrew's um, uh, comments. Andrew, do you have any immediate response to that, or should we move on to the? Well, I, I think I do, but I think it actually will bridge us to the next topic anyway. So, um, uh, so let me say this: if if the if the basic idea here is okay, suppose that we want this, how do we do it? Um, I, I think the the problem that um, I keep struggling with a little bit is what the value of this is. That is. Sometimes what we want, like the 3GPP um, example is a good one. Oh, you've got this sort of uh, link in this access network, and that's um, that's one style of networking. And then basically you connect, um, to, you know, in the next hop with uh, with the internet. If the idea is you, we need to replace that next hop with uh, a um, you know uh, vertical integrated uh, system of some kind, then then what that is is really a, a discussion about replacing the existing internet with a new network, um, maybe running them alongside each other, and then eventually cutting over to it. On the other hand, if what we're talking about is very specialized network use cases that then are going to be interconnected to one another, well, that's just the internet, right? It's a network that has a particular local um, kinds of things, and then you've got a network at the other end, and you, you want to interconnect them in some way. And that's actually, I mean, I mean, we had those. We've had other kinds of networks like that, and every time IP wins in those use cases. And that suggests that IP has certain properties for that kind of interconnection model that is particularly good, and, uh, and that the internet style of interconnecting in this case is particularly useful for that. So I think that this is one of these cases where we really need to be quite clear about what gap it is we think we're filling and I, I feel like maybe the biggest problem that um, people are having in some of this discussion is that they don't know which engineering problem we're tackling. This is an engineering problem. It's a question of like what the trade-offs are going to be, um, uh, much more um, than it, it, it starts as a governance problem. It starts as an engineering problem. Uh, it maybe has governance consequences, but the first thing we have to decide is, hey, what is the engineering problem that we're trying to tackle? Because if the problem is a very specific gap, then we can figure out um, how to how to how to fix that. Whereas if what this is is a gap that involves um, something involving replacing, you know, very low level level layer three or something like that protocols on the internet, it's a bigger deal because you know that's all new silicon, it's all new routers, everybody's got to um, replace all you know get all new all new equipment, and some of that stuff hasn't been invented yet. It's very easy to um, you know have um, have the great features in the thing that hasn't been invented yet and compare that to the sort of nasty, you know, tatty old version that you've got that's actually deployed because, you know, the future thing is always on, uh, hasn't been invented yet. Well, then let's, um, let's move on to the more technical um, elements of this. Um, so, so Richard, um, how developed is the proposal? I know one of the things that frustrated me when I saw uh, some media coverage of, of this new IP idea was that people were talking as if uh, this were a fully developed protocol that China wanted to use to uh, completely uh, change the internet. And then on the other hand, I heard uh, you and other people say, well, this is just a research idea. So. What is going on here? Is this an architecture or is it a protocol? What are some of the key technical areas where change should or should not be made? Okay, so um, it's also a huge question. But uh, first, I would like to say, don't trust media. <laughs> right? So media, lots of misinformation and disinformation there. And uh, it's quite misleading. And uh, it's so unfortunate people even make a, like a decision and uh, influenced uh, from the media. For example, one good friend, and uh, he actually holds a very high, very really senior position in Cisco. The one that he called me, talked to me about that. And from that, look at the uh, technical publications. Like uh, there are tons of publications there. And uh, they're, they're, it's starting like uh, 2017, and I uh, and started to publish that. So, and, uh, Technically, like uh, so, especially inside Edsa, Edsa is an, uh, another SDO. They know that, and uh, 
uh, here it's uh, the reason we solve the problem. So the reason the OT ICT conversion is one of the problem we want to solve. Right? We want to maintain the integrity of the internet. Consider the internet as one network, maybe global one, and of many different network cell. And uh, so we want to add or enrich, enhance and uh, the functionalities of the current IP. So Andrew like, made a good point that like, Olio said that where is the gap here, right? So, so we found the gap and then we want to add it and, uh, and uh, find it like through so that. And uh, it's an extension of new IP or improve the new IP or run now or gen generically we call that new IP can solve those problems there. So uh, all the solutions are based on the kind of IP, uh, IPv4 or IPv6 actually, both of them. So we extend it and we add more functionalities or features as a data plan. And it's called data plan, right? You have a control plan, you have a data plan. We add those to that so that later your switch and router can be implemented to support those capabilities, new capabilities or services so that CT and ICT will be fully converged. So uh, uh, you know that you asked me about technical detail. Do you want to talk, uh, ask, talk about the, like, uh, the, the real format or just what the pack really looks like or, or what? Right. So what we do here, right? So just uh, think about this, right? When the internet was this kind of like a work was done, it's inside the IFIP in 1960s, right? So uh, that time a packet is not called a packet. Actually, it's called it was called ladlegram. Ladle is a uh, I send you a ladle, right? And sometimes we mail, right? So we are using like a, a post office. So an IP packet or technology and simulates mail system. So a mail, you have an envelope and you have ladle inside. So the ladle inside becomes a payload and the envelope later becomes a header. So if you look at the IP packet, it has two portions. One is a header, another is a payload. Payload is usually unstructured, so it's just a, some opaque data and the router should not, uh, should, should not know about it. The header and the routers uh, could make sense um, of it. Over so many years, like uh, similarly in uh, like uh, career services, right now we know that FedEx, right? But what's the difference between FedEx and the classical mail here? So a FedEx can guarantee something. Let's say I want to have uh, 24 hours overnight shipment. So Today I send a like FedEx package. So next morning, the, my package will be somewhere. Of course, it will subject to some physical constraints. You cannot ask for anything. For example, send my package to to Santa. Let's say some children actually <laughs> did this, right? So send my package to mom, my mom. So so simply you cannot suppose you can, and then FedEx will do that. So if we compare FedEx package and the mail system, so the FedEx package has one more paper that's a slip or something. So the user or sender actually write down your requirements. Says that, okay, I want this package, 24 hours uh, shipment, three day shipment or one week shipment, right? It doesn't matter. So this information is so critical for operation of FedEx system. So FedEx and will deliver your package, not only like uh, according to your destination, that's a receiver's address, and also this FedEx slip. So in new IP here, one we add one component. So the component is a simulation of such a FedEx slip. Say that, okay, in addition, let's say, I won't send a packet from California to Andrew's home. So I put Andrew's as my destination. In addition, because so important, I want next day, next morning, uh, deliver it. So we give that package to FedEx. So in this sense, new IP is a simulation of FedEx 
and IPv4 v6 is a simulation of the um, classical mail post office mail system. So um, uh, that's about the CT and ICT. So if we do this and the new IP or IP or extend the IP, improve the IP, we will have new capabilities and it can do more, just not only connectivity and delivery, it can also support new capabilities and so that we can deliver under some requirements. These requirements coming from the sender or user. So it's the old uh, QoS, is it? Um, and um, I've heard, um, I mean, is that what you mean by deterministic forwarding? Uh, deterministic forwarding, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terminology used uh, in ITF and it's uh, in DevNet there. It's a partly, um, it is. So in new IP, actually, it goes beyond that. We call that high precision communication. The reason we want to call it a high precision communication, uh, we, it, is, uh, uh, we have other reasons. And uh, do you want me to talk about it? <laughs> Well, I don't want to get too technical here, but I think the, yeah. the main question, uh, which I'm not sure you're answering, is, is, is all this worked out? Is this all developed? Have you defined it? It's, uh, 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 we have, uh, like, uh, initially we did the research gap analysis. That was a few years ago. And we did a conceptual um, research. Uh, we did an experimental uh, research, some testing. I also did some, like, uh, like uh, mathematical, physical analysis. And uh, it's uh, for majority of it, it's done. And it looks that the idea uh, is solid, viable, and uh, feasible in implementation. So and, and starting from this year, we are in the beginning of that. We want to open up this technology. We want to share it with the public. And, uh, and also possibly it's uh, like a standardization because we believe that open standards and make standards open is a key to let internet to be successful. So we want to uh, we want to be a multi um, stakeholder and uh, participation. Actually, it has happened. So initially, it was a really small project. Like uh, so, right now it's fairly big, and many uh, countries, many especially universities, and they have joined it. They did the independent research, prototyping, they publish their publications. Also, there were some like uh, uh, dedicated conferences on those. So, as I said, that so uh, new IP. Just imagine if you don't like new IP, this kind of not ne uh, next generation IP. Call it FedEx IP. Okay, that might be simpler. FedEx IP, all the uh, IP or not all the IP v4, v6 is called a US okay. right. pure, US pure IP. Right, if you want that. All right, uh, Andrew, Mr. Mr. Old IP, uh, do you want to uh, comment on uh, some element of that? Well, I, look, I think um, I, I really like analogies. I think that analogies are extraordinarily helpful to understand uh, most of the things that we, um, uh, you know, that are new inventions and so on, because really you need to understand uh, the unknown with things that you already know. And so analogies are very helpful. Uh, but I think that this particular analogy is uh, uh, is really clever, but it has some, uh, it's a little misleading. So one of the features of, of the internet um, is that it isn't actually one network, right? It's multiple networks. It's an internet. And what that means is that the different networks have different properties in them. Now, this is a place in which the uh, in which the postal analogy actually helps us because one of the features of of the postal system is that it's a cost fixed um, uh, um, system with a standardized uh, format and that standardized format is delivered everywhere for generally the same price. Um, uh, so you've got a sort of standard postal mail and you put a stamp on the outside and as long as it's within the uh, service uh, service area of that postal system, it's a flat rate. Um, one of the features of FedEx, of course, is that it doesn't actually go everywhere. And um, there are lots of places where they say they simply will not um, uh, deliver on um, these things. And it's really a negotiation between you. Moreover, the user in this in this case has to make decisions about this. So the other piece about IP and the reason that we keep falling into the idea that the internet is one network is because that's the user experience of the internet. 
the user experience of the internet is that it's all this big flat space and it's all just network services for you. If you have to make a choice, if you have to think about what are my use cases um, uh, for, for this datagram or this packet uh, that I'm going to send, you then have to go to you know, the post office or the FedEx office, or you've got to go to a box on the street and see whether the little green sign is there to tell you whether today's collection has happened. And, and those are all things that are, are forced as, as part of the user's experience of this. So if what we have to do is tell applications, hey, you have to start thinking about what the, what the needs are for your low-level traffic in order to make a decision about which kind of network you're going to use. Well, it's not clear actually that this is IP in any sense at all then, because um, it moves that, um, that decision about which network you've got to um, use in order to get the guarantees that you want out to the edge. But that, to come back to the original thing, uh, that is precisely what the internet originally did. If you go back to read the end-to-end -end arguments paper, one of the things that's interesting about it is that people talk about this as though it's machines, end-to-end, -end, the machines are doing this. But actually, the end-to-end -end arguments paper um, doesn't talk about that. It talks about the applications. Applications do not have to live on a single machine. And, and so the, the reality about this is that the end point in this is, is the intelligence of the application trying to make a decision about what kinds of properties it needs from the network. And what that means is you want to strip out as much intelligence as possible from the low-level network uh, protocols because you got to implement them in the application anyway. And if that's the case, then all you really need here is a layer three model that just delivers a very simple sort of, I promise to get it there within this time a deterministic networking model, and really not much more to it. And under those circumstances, we're back to the internet model. Because in that case, the application needs to make the decisions. And all of this stuff about how the router is going to do these things and all the rest of it is really a distraction because it's a question of what kind of properties the network that you're connected to is going to provide, rather than what kind of properties the internet is going to provide. The internet remains the um, you know, best efforts networking in order to deliver this kind of thing with this smooth end-to-end -end, um, uh, property. And what you've got to then have is another level of service in some sense in order to build uh, in order to build that up. But the application needs to know what kinds of decisions it needs to make in order to in order to use that kind of functionality. And that that to me is a little bit different from the proposals that we've seen so far because many of the pro proposals that I've read anyway seem to be pushing. Um, uh, some of those decisions down into the network. They're providing sort of network services um, that g um, give these kinds of guarantees. And that's not a very internet-like thing. And that's a, actually a, a conceptual difference between these two models. Um, that is, oh, that's, that's that is not only, oh, sorry, go ahead. That's very fundamental, this issue. I'd like to, to hang on this for a bit. Um, the sure. the end-to-end -end, um, argument, and um, I, I have seen in some discussions I've had with Huawei engineers, some criticism of the end-to-end -end model, and maybe uh, Richard, are you are you departing from that? And and I think um, Andrew makes a very strong case for a separation of the layers here between the networking layer and the application layer. So are you challenging that? You think we need to move beyond that? Yeah, it's uh, okay. Let me comment on that. So that's that's the way we start to have difference here, right? So and. Uh, uh, what pa Andrew said uh, is right with respect to what Internet is or what Internet was. So Internet was designed the best effort that globally like used, right? That, that, that was true and that continues to be true. I'm not changing that. But think about this. Internet is a system to deliver information from A to B, right? So it's called a delivery system. And FedEx IP or FedEx is another type of delivery system. Post office mail is a delivery system. FedEx, like a service office, is another delivery system. But can we consider them as a, in a more generic senses, like it's a still delivery system? So in that case, so my point is that we should expand the scope of internet to cover other things. For example, right now in post office, they all they also provided some guaranteed services, almost the exact same way as FedEx does. But then maybe you know there are some 
differences right there. So here, my point is that we need to expand the scope of the internet in order to serve the you know, economy, industry. After all, why do we need to do this? We want to do something like uh, to make uh, our economy grow. So that's why I said that it's uh, my belief the internet right now is the engine for the economic growth. Look at the Wall Street, the, those companies, right? All the internet related the companies, their business is good, right? So, so it's an engine. So I want to add more gas, more fuel to this engine here. So that is same. I generally, and that's for that. So I um, partly agree with Andrew with respect to the classical post office. So that's how internet was defined. But what we are doing is that we are expanding the scope of internet. Just actually last year, in uh, I gave a keynote speech in GovCom. I told them that so come the internet, actually there's a limit. We want to go beyond that limit to cover more cases. So come back to a question and asked by Milton and, and saying that uh, and layers here, layers uh, application layer and network layer. It's true, and uh, we have uh, layers here, which I agree that's obviously an uh, internet model defines that. So typically you have five layers here. You have the top is an application, like a news mail, right? And then under that, you have end to end model that typically TCP, UDP, quick. And then you have a network layer that's hop to hop. And then you have a link layer, typically Ethernet, Gigabit Ethernet, and then optical, physical layer, right? So you have five layers here. Each layer uh, is like a, a divided. They have special functions. And for the best effort in the internet, it works well. So because I have a TCB here, that's fine. So uh, if you want guarantee when the packet sooner or later gets there, use TCP. If you don't care, if your path is lost or not, use UDP, that's fine. But when we say, suppose I want to solve the problems I described earlier, like guarantee something, and then we found that here, wait a second, like if let's say I use TCP here to deliver my message, suppose my packet is lost somewhere, somehow, and then TCP people say, that, okay, simple, I retransmit. But let's do a math here. When you retransmit your packet, your latency uh, is not just simply double, actually it's a triple, right? Because why? after you send a packet, you start a timer. That time is called a retransmission timer. The retransmit timer is roughly the same as a round trip time. So from A to B, from B to A. So during this time, you have not received the acknowledgement. Okay, let's retransmit it. So you send a packet from A to B again, so that's triple. But in some industrial applications, yes, I get your packet, but sorry, that's too late. So here, the, using the transport to deliver something here, so all my point is that we solve the industrial problems at the application layer, at the transport layer, and it's not simply possible. This can be mathematically proven, right? So, so how can we solve it? We have to take a look at the network layer. So at the hop to hop layer, we solve it. So that's why we are working on network layer to improve the IP packet. So instead of like a, a improving like TCP, UDP, uh, transport layer, it's not. Very interesting. Yeah. You want to jump in, Andrew? We're going to have to move on to the next item though. After. Well, but I think that this um, this highlights a point that is related, uh, I think, to other parts of our conversation. It's very slippery which thing we're talking about here. If we're talking about specialized network uh, use cases where somebody really needs these kinds of guarantees, um, then it may well be the case that you've got to have a new network technology for that because you're trying to ask for guarantees that TCP cannot provide. I'm not totally convinced that that's the case, but there there's an engineering question there. Um, that's very different from saying we want the internet to be upgraded to that kind of thing. Because when I have those very tight um, uh, a con a connectivity requirements and so on, I've already got a, a, a situation where the applications are involved in this and so on. So it's not actually uh, it's not actually a general purpose technology in that case in the way that IP and TCP IP and Quick and all the rest of it are intended to be. And you've got to make that, uh, we've got to make that distinction, whether that's the kind of problem we're talking about or whether we're talking about, you know, all kinds of other stuff. The other question then is uh, is actually a, um, a sort of 
it really is more of a governance question, which is whether we're going to pack all of these other requirements into the lower layers and thereby make the fundamental technologies of the network have to provide the, these kinds of services to everybody, because that makes for a very, you know, it makes for a complete replacement of essentially all of the hardware on the internet that we've got deployed today. Um, the last time we managed to do a forklift upgrade on the internet was 1983, so I don't think it's very likely that we're going to be able to do that um, that quickly. And so at some point we're going to have to have some way in which this comes together with the existing IP layer, and at that point all of the TCP IP um, questions come right back into play anyway. So it doesn't seem to me that we're we're being totally clear about this, like which left side of this line we're, we're living on. If this is just, you know, control networks, industrial networks, that kind of thing, then that's one set of problems, but they're a constrained, uh, they're a constrained set. A short yeah. uh, follow-up, if you allow me. Okay, quickly. Uh, okay, yeah, quickly. So, and uh, actually, and you still brings the, uh, you know, point of going back, to the like internet couples and uh, uh, OT or not, uh, and you also like uh, mentioned a uh, general purpose like uh, network here, right? And yes, kind of internet the general purpose, but general purpose has another synonym. For me, that is a minimal common purpose communication. So what the internet solves right now, for me, it's a minimal common purpose line. So it's still. Um, depends on like, uh, do you want to expand the scope or not? So for me, we should expand the scope. So not only serving minimal common purpose applications, we should uh, also serve some other purposes, so other like uh, application. They may not be common purpose, but they are still in our society, in our industry. And so that the internet will really serve them because if we don't want to serve them, they will be forgotten. They will be isolated. They are not going to benefit from the success. They are not going to share the success and of internet. Internet has a wealth of technology. We do not want another part of the society, like waste their own time, develop their own like network scale. For me, I want to maintain integrity of the internet as early and, and, and earlier I said that. So I want such networks part of it. Actually, there are so many such networks. Currently, they are isolated. They are not part of the internet. So I want those networks part of it. So that's a start from the, like, uh, you know, that's a different here. It's a, as we discussed earlier, should, should we do it or not? Should that be included or not? If they are like not included, if let's say, okay, let's make decision, we should exclude them, and then there will be no discussion. If say, okay, we need to include them, and then we have more discussion, that we're more technical, or, or, or you know, it's an engineering problem, or protocol problem, or technical problem, software problem, and, or it's a chip problem, or, so, you know, or other things, right? So, yeah, that's a quick follow-up. Sorry. Okay, that's, uh, that's, I think that's uh, one of the fundamental um, issues that we've identified is this um, layering and whether we're, we're breaking or changing that model. But we need to move on. I think uh, another question that is really interesting about this is the question of, of the venue in which these um, standardization decisions would get worked out. Um, so it, it looks to much of the world as if uh, Huawei has gone to the ITU as the primary standards organization, uh, although I, I do know that they did approach the IETF. Um, and there's another option, of course, and that is that uh, Huawei would simply develop this uh, as a standard on its own and uh, start selling equipment in the marketplace and perhaps uh, eventually become a de facto standard or an accepted standard by many people in the industry uh, based on, on market uh, decisions. And uh, this really matters. I mean, uh, most of the crowd you're talking to here, Richard, are probably pretty fond of and familiar with the internet institutions, the, the regional internet registries, the ICANN, the IETF, and they're comfortable in that environment. And there are many good things about that environment. It's sort of its openness and its individualism, if you will, not based on states or on corporations. Um, so what, you know, is the proper venue for pursuing this a pretty systematic change or upgrade in uh, the internet protocols. 
the question I suppose for me, uh, is that right? Uh, Both of you will take a okay. crack at it, definitely. All right, so, okay. So um, for me, right, ITU, I, ITF, 3GPP, uh, HC, uh, they have different expert, different uh, like participants with different uh, expertise coming from different places. So each SDO has its own strengths. For me, it appears that all the SDOs should collaborate because you know they have you know different uh, um, strengths. So and in this particular case, maybe I'm wrong. Like Anu, Anu is an expert also who's a very strong leadership position there. Maybe have different opinion, but uh, that's my opinion. So in the case of new IP, it's best to let the IT works on vision. Uh, use cases, requirement, and architecture, maybe root map. The reason I say so is that so far I never, I have never seen an IFC or some leadership guys there talking about the ITF like a vision, future root map, so in which you, they do which you. What they do is that it's a, like a bottom up, just a, those like a leadership sit there, wait for other guys to prove something. If something makes sense, okay, do it, right? So it's, a, it's, it's, it's another way. So ITU, they collect all the opinions, requirements, right? So let them do it. But for the protocol itself, uh, we should let ITF to standardize a new IP. This is my belief. And actually, we also put it in action. So probably you already knew that. So uh, that's just one story. Some people when like uh, in ITU, they publish something. Actually, people don't know another story and uh, I can share. Actually, me, I'm personally already presented new IP and in IAB, that's the Internet Architecture Board. And I have organized three side meetings. Moreover, something I don't think people know that last year and only last year, we saw that, so we should, uh, because that's my like uh, belief that we should uh, make a standard open, let the IETF to be the owner and home for new IP. So last year, we think that uh, there was a decision why we uh, will sponsor an ITF in Vancouver, Vancouver meeting. I think that's IT 107. And I was supposed to talk about new IP on Thursday. Normally Thursday, we have a Thursday brown back lunch beach sale. So and uh, so I so so for that one I want the people like uh, think about that like uh, maybe okay I know that because I'm uh, I'm going ITF like many many times I know it very very well right so the mentality is still like uh, information technology mentality me too I was converted so I'm uh, I was an IT guy only uh, since 2015 I started to. And convert myself to some OT industry guy, right? So change the mentality, tell them what's the problem, yes. And after Vancouver meeting, we started to do that. Uh, actually, we have done that. So that's uh, what I'm thinking. So we should uh, like uh, let the uh, uh, ITF do the protocol standardization. And uh, so another Muda has mentioned that the Huawei say it's uh, like just make something stand, sell the product to the customer. It's a uh, uh, defect to them. Actually, it's untrue. And, uh, from the beginning, we like invited like uh, uh, multiple like uh, stakeholders, uh, including customers, some competitors, and also the academia like researchers, right? And some people joined it independently, like uh, through the international open conferences. So that's not true. But uh, look that right now, there are only four incumbent vendors, right? And here, so I mean major big ones there. So other like vendors are not even thinking about uh, like a uh, long future. Actually, I talked with uh, Juniper Engineering and CTO, and uh, he also visited me uh, in my office, right? So we talked about that. They also shared about that. Kind of, I also talked with some like, Cisco fellows, right? So this told me that for them, if the two years, if some project like so, some work is for like two years, for them it's only long term, right? So what they do is a uh, map for this year, map for next year. So this work looks like a five or maybe 10, maybe 15, right? It's a long way to go. So they are not interested, but they like watch, like uh, read it, and then sometimes we'll have casual meetings uh, to discuss on and, and yet. They know what we are doing and it's it's fully and open to, um, 
to them. So that's a question, uh, that's a, a short clarification to Milton's only said that why we want to start to, that's not true. Actually, we want to open. So coming back to the venue here. Just, just a correction, Richard. I didn't say that you were doing that. I said that oh. that could be done. That, that's a perfectly viable oh. path yeah. forward that some, yeah. some vendor might want to develop their own standard and see if it right. flies. Yeah, that could do, but I don't think that that's the right way uh, because um, uh, uh, success of the internet uh, depends on the everyone, everywhere, every sector, right? We should uh, participate, contribute uh, your like uh, idea, right? Because as like Andrew earlier said, internet of uh, really a uh, network networks, but uh, who does the networks here? The who is own, or uh, who owns it? Who makes the uh, boxes? Who is using that? Everybody, it should be open. Multi stakeholders, so everybody should join. So, so we have an open policy here. Come back to the venue here. So, for me, certainly I hope IETF will standardize it. But the problem, it's a tricky, intriguing here, is that should the ITF, like, is ITF willing to do it or not, right? So, I have talked with people, I heard something, like, oh, Richard, we are already so busy, so our maybe five, ten years, we are not going to consider any other protocol except IPv6. We are getting deeply worried. So, IPv6 is already 25 years. Market share, probably 20% or even less. Some people told me, one guy told me that, like, you know, 40%, but no matter what, it's still a small market share. They don't see the light in the tunnel. So they sort of that way, if your new IP gets standardized, we are having three protocols here. It's not going to be manageable, right? So, so can you like wait for like uh, another 10 years until like uh, IPv6 gets like uh, full like replacement of IPv4? I can wait, okay. In 10 years, maybe I have already retired, right? That's fine, uh, that's okay. The industry does not. The reason is that, so you know that you mentioned that 5G earlier. So 5G is going to enable some applications. In the next two or three years, probably until 2023, and um, latest 2025. So the deployment probably is everywhere. And then people will develop these new applications. So new, after new applications are, you know, are developed, they like to like uh, hook them to the internet. But the internet is not ready for them. So currently in like a HC, in other parts, they already clearly told me that, okay, if the Richard, that time I will, I work with the HC, there was a group called the NGP. So if we don't have technology, we are going to solve it in architecture. In architecture, they are solving it by using MEC, that's a Mac, mobile edge computing. Why? They say that, okay, since nothing is guaranteed, let me put my data, my application, closer to the base station. The closest port is same place as the base station. You see that the MEC is proliferating. Why? Think about it. Suppose IP can solve it, internet can solve it, and then we do not need to do so. So the architecture of 5G will be the same as 4G. Right now it's different. The reason, partly the reason is that the fixed line technology cannot catch up with the uh, CT technology there. Of course, so that's why I want to expand the scope from minimal common purpose application to like a, to like a wider like a purpose and application. Okay. We're going to have to, uh, we're, we're approaching an hour now. I want to let Andrew uh, respond to this and then we, we need to uh, try to open it up to questions and talk about some of the broader governance implications as well. So Andrew? So, so thanks. Uh, I think that sometimes the way that this issue is being discussed is as a, a sort of venue wars. Um, oh, should this be in the IETF? Should this be in the ITU? Uh, whatever. And I know that there are people who are very concerned about that, uh, about the politics of that. And I sometimes worry about it because, of course, the ITU is ultimately a government's only uh, uh, venue, and I'm not sure that national governments are really the best place to design our future networked world. But, but there's another more fundamental issue here, and this has to do with this idea about whether you need a full architecture or whether what you need is to build um, pieces that can be reused and interlock with one another in new and interesting ways. 
my view is that the, the building block architecture is a better one. And the reason I think that is, in fact, a, a piece of architectural document that the Internet Architecture Board produced some while ago. Uh, it's RFC 5218, which asks about what makes a successful protocol. And one of the most important things that they discover in that document, I was not on the IEB when this uh, was, was written, uh, one of the most important things that they, um, uh, that they discovered was that the incremental deployability of a protocol is super important to its success. And in fact, IPv6 is a great example of this, uh, of this issue. It's not incrementally deployable because it's formally incompatible with IPv4. And so you've basically got to stand both things up at the same time. But the properties of that kind of, uh, of protocol have a huge resistance to deployment because there's basically no reason to deploy it unless you absolutely need it. And in the case of IPv6, nobody absolutely needed it until we ran out of IPv4 um, addresses. That is why big architectures tend not to be uh, tend not to be preferred in the uh, in the IETF environment. Not because people have an allergy to it, or because the IETF doesn't want um, uh, to work on big architectures or something like that. It's because if you build the big architecture and then you decide, oh, now we've got to deploy this everywhere. What you're really talking about is a global replacement of a, of a deployed system, and that's very, very hard to do. So the question here is, you know, I, I think it's interesting to talk about whether the ITU or the IETF is a better place to talk about architectures, but I think before we get to that thing, we should ask ourselves whether we need a global replacement architecture for the, uh, for the Internet, because if that's what we're saying, well, you know, I think that's an interesting research project, but I don't think it's an engineering problem at all. I think the answer for that is it's never going to get deployed because nobody has the incentives to be the first mover there. It's enormously expensive and it doesn't have the incremental advantages, so you never make any revenue on the uh, on the first day. That's the real problem for people who are trying to build a business. How do they keep the thing running while they're deploying? And I I think that that's you know a, a really difficult um, case. And that's why if these are specialized networks, it's a different story because specialized networks, of course, do have these properties of needing to build this thing out for just this uh, particular use case. And we see that over and over again. In any case, I could go on about that for a long time, but I'll, rather than doing that, I'll turn this over to questions. So uh, I need to ask a really big question. Can I like answer it? Uh, very quickly. Well, okay, so and you say that, are we going to replace, like to have a global replacement? Like the short answer is yes, no. And uh, are we working change the architecture? The short answer is no. So the reason we call that new IP, actually, uh, many years ago, we talked with the BT, and they also they helped me like, to work on something. Like in stay in, you know, within the kind of framework architecture, we are not. Uh, no. So new IP fit exactly in the kind of uh, internet and architecture framework, and then. Incremental deployability, actually, I fully uh, agree with Andrew here. So I'm glad that he mentioned this because I'm, I have been asked question about uh, like, uh, like uh, compatibility. Like uh, actually compatibility usually is a backward uh, compatibility. A better name is uh, interoperability. And uh, for the new things there, so it's an even better, better one. It's the uh, incremental deployability. Actually, we are following that. I, and that one, I, uh, I'm glad he mentioned that. So for, from what we are working on, and also custom here, right now, as I said earlier, it's a, it's a, like a keep the internet or internet technology catch up with the communication technology, especially in 3GPB here. So there are two or three like examples here. One is uh, for the factory. In the factory, normally you have a floor building, building and a building here. So that's not like uh, always Wi-Fi or like wireless, right? So you did some Lying there, so that's an enterprise network. You can deploy new IP. Actually, I have a fairly big customer um, um, for that, right? So last year they they give like uh, some requirement. So that's uh, one one deployment. I also mentioned that we need uh, some fixed line technology between G node B and core network or MEC network here. So currently this fixed line network is part of the internet. IP and MPOS and uh, is deployed. So what new IP does is not going to replace them, 
is to re, uh, reuse them, not replacement, it's reuse them, so that this part of network has more capabilities, more functions, more services, so that we can support the upcoming services. So that's uh, initially an, uh, an deployment will test, and uh, this like a deployment in these scenarios happen to be in the current Internet Arctic. Nothing's changed yet. So it's not, UIP is not looking for global replacement, not at all. Okay. So um, let's, let's uh, try to move on to questions then. So um, Brendan, we're going to try to uh, upgrade people who want to ask a question, and then uh, they will ask their question in a very concise manner, or I will mute them, mercilessly mute them. Um, so uh, indicate your willingness to ask a question um, uh, in its general subject matter in the chat, and then uh, <clears throat> if you want to speak, Brendan, we'll, we'll upgrade you. And Milton, I also collected a couple of questions uh, in the chat while you guys were discussing okay. uh, Do you want the to issues. Read those? Let's uh, just sure? read, those, read those off then. Uh, sure. So um, here's a question from Laura Denardis. Why are critical applications which have been using TCP IP for decades, often in combination with SLAs from network operators, now being called over-the-top applications? He's interested in the rationale for this linguistic turn to describe the same thing. Okay, which one of you wants to handle that, Andrew or Richard? Andrew. Uh, I, I'm happy to, to look. The let's be perfectly honest with ourselves. Over the top was a way of describing certain kinds of network protocols. Um, that came from a regulatory environment where there was this traditional uh, approach of, of regulating the, the network service. And it's an attempt to make the network service, you know, and to apply that to the internet and, and say that the network service is still regulated. Um, so that was, that's the origin of that. that the, the origin of this is basically effectively an attempt to map an old time approach to how you understand the features of the network into a network that doesn't work that way. Um, and probably not incidentally, but I wouldn't want to impute um, to anybody, you know, uh, nefarious motives to make sure that the regulator could still collect the money from the formerly regulated service that is now effectively free. Um, the most obvious example of this, of course, was voice. Um, which was uh, uh, at long distances a, uh, a a tariff service that tended to provide lots of income for certain um, in certain places, and suddenly that becomes effectively free. So that's really the point of the linguistic turn that it turns it, it turns simple data from end to end into a thing that is uh, that is regulated. I think that's different from the um, operational networks. Um, that uh, that this technology, the vertically integrated um, uh, effort, is supposed to address, right? This case is really a kind of control system that really needs precise timings from end to end, and that case is one that is extraordinarily difficult to handle over, uh, over TCP IP, although it's possible because we see people doing research over that. Um, so that's the difference between the o, uh, the over-the-top and operational technology. And I just wanted to make sure that the two things were not conflated um, because it sounded to me in the question like they, they might have been. Great, thanks, Andrew. So we have a question from Mark. Uh, Mark, I went ahead and promoted you. So if you wanna go ahead and ask your question. Oh, it looks like we lost Mark. Sorry, I'm just confused. Uh, this is Mark. I was just confused by the user experience. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, an observation and then a, a question for Richard. This is Mark Swanzerich from Microsoft, by the way. Um, it, it seems to me that the, the Chinese domestic market is, is very huge and um, also that um, the Chinese national government has a lot of control about um, you know the 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 boundaries of the Chinese network, and that they can control 
uh, what happens within the Chinese national network. I mean, I know there's no such thing, but the, the internet within China's borders could be uh, substantially controlled by the Chinese government. They could set their own standards. They, um, the market is big enough that they could mandate the creation of silicon and the replacement of hardware, et cetera. I mean, they could have mandated the wholesale adoption of IPv6 if they had been interested in it. Um, so it, it occurs to me that the Chinese government could simply say, uh, these new IP concepts shall be implemented for all Chinese uh, companies, services, government entities, etc., cetera, um, and then force that to exist side by side within China until the technology is uh, mature, uh, all the while working through the ITU to sort of uh, propose the concept to say, look, we are doing the development work here. We are prototyping it. We are doing the proofs of concept. Um, and then during capacity building, the sort of activity that happens within the United Nations, uh, they could say, hey, I have something that is now proven to work. Would you like to do this? It, you know, for people who don't have a lot of capacity, that would not actually be a wholesale replacement necessarily. It could be brand new infrastructure. And so my question is to Richard, are you seeing an interest within uh, within China, either the government or, or other entities, to take such an approach, to mandate new IP concepts within China and um, push them forward just simply in isolation within okay. China think, and see how things go? That, I think you've made that point. The, the question is, uh, yeah, is, is China going to do that? Or do you yes, see any indication China is going to do that? Right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your question. And I think the answer actually is larger, much larger than what I know and larger than my expertise. And mostly I work with uh, European uh, customers, carriers and companies and work with them. But uh, I have limited like knowledge about that. But uh, even from such lim uh, limited knowledges, and uh, I never heard that like Chinese government actually um, like uh, endorses a uh, new IP uh, or not. But uh, just on the contrary, in a public uh, an ACM meeting, so I talked with some like uh, participants like from China, they told me that they are working on IPv6. And so um, they, they have no idea um, about uh, new IP. I think uh, uh, even in China, new IP still stays in the private uh, sector. And, uh, and uh, from, you know, from the list of customers here, and I have been working with last few years, and all of them are European ones. Thank you. So for I would, your... Yeah, I would like to follow up on that question. So uh, as you're probably aware, and it's probably an uncomfortable topic for you, but um, one of the reasons new IP is so controversial is that is it's perceived uh, you know, within the context of the U.S. attack on Huawei and exclusion of Huawei and the general uh, deterioration of and decoupling of China and the U.S. Uh, Internet economies, uh, this is perceived as a move to take over and fundamentally redefine the nature of the Internet. Um, so I, I, I think uh, what Mark was describing was a possible pathway in which China might try to do that. And uh, do you see uh, the, the objectives of new IP as a way to sort of elevate China's role in, in global internet governance? Um, absolutely not. I see that new IP from the right beginning, it was designed to support uh, like industrial applications to serve the European uh, market initially, right? So start uh, in, like, uh, in SC. But in SC, some opinions are different. One is that okay, you we, you know extend, improve IP. Another like opinion is that okay, let's do something new. That's uh, that's not an um, IP. So we divided actually. So we worked together for a few years. So and uh, and uh, because from the you know interaction with European customers, so they prefer the new IP extension for multiple reasons like uh, investment protection and uh, also like uh, cost reduction, lots, lots of reasons, like expertise, education, many, many reasons. 
So I had several meetings with some high level and uh, executive there. So it's motivated by the real problems there. So, so, um, and, there. so and also you know that like uh, industrial uh, industry for the old, they also need something like this, right? So uh, it has been talked about already a few years. Uh, industrial internet, uh, we have talked about it 10 years. The will is a protocol for the industrial internet. Practically none. So it's a, uh, and most of they are working on 10 megabit Ethernet. So that's the industrial Ethernet, but it's not industrial Internet, right? So talk about that. And uh, I don't see that. And on the other hand, because we have talked about that, that's a FedEx that can IP thing there, because new IP will guarantee uh, some latency, pack loss, that kind of thing. Any state actor, no matter you know, who he is or it he is, it's very hard for them to control my new IP packet here. The reason is that because I'm, I'm going to bring a few more parameters to the internet. Come the internet, it's called a link state. Link state basically is just one matrix. When you forward the packet out, you look for the shortest path, right? Shortest path. So that's it. After you add more matrix to it, all of a sudden, the control of the internet will be more complex. Scaling is all the issue. So the only solution here is that only decentralize to decentralize the control. Decentralize the control plan, no matter who he is. This technical nature here. I, as I said earlier, like uh, I never get the information, never got any knowledge, like like Chinese government is involved here. Like uh, it's, uh, it's so unfortunate actually for me to hear something here. I know some media have, have cooked some story. <laughs> For me, we're, trying to, we're trying to get a better, um, a yeah. more uh, accurate uh, depiction of what's going on here. I do have to say one thing. I have, uh, I have direct evidence that the Chinese government was actually ordering everybody to convert to IPv6 that as was. of uh, two, year, two years ago. And uh, uh, I don't know how successful that has been. <laughs> True, and I happen to know uh, the one who was responsible for that project like 20 years ago. So he invited me to visit him like 20 years ago. So we talked about that. So that time he worked on IPv6. A couple years ago, I saw him and uh, in an international conference, right? We just uh, told me that the so official position, uh, as far as I know, is still IPv6 there. So new IP still stays in the private sector. And Huawei, of course, involved here, and also multiple European and uh, companies were also involved there. And uh, so here, and then, so from the problems we are trying to solve, all of them coming from the Europe. Okay, Andrew, do you want to get in on this? Well, I, I, I think first of all, it's really important um, for me to say, and and really for the Internet Society uh, as well, to be very clear that we think that um, multiple uh, vendors, whatever the nationality of their um, origins and so on, having multiple people working on uh, the development of the, of the network, of the internet and of other networks um, is important. And I don't think that, uh, I, I recognize that some of the froth around this has to do with geopolitics that are way above my pay grade. Um, that said, there is a, uh, a, a an issue about the proposals as they exist, which have this property uh, that since the network has a lot more uh, of a stake in what happens to various packets that go through it, uh, the regulatory pinch point from the point of view of any government moves from the you know the devices and the applications that are under the control of the user into places uh, where the network gets to interfere. And that's part of the reason that I keep harping on about this question, what is, you know, what are the use cases we're trying to address? If this is the industrial network, um, you know, there are real questions about how many of that, how much of that network wants to be exposed to the internet at all. It's not always obvious that we want every industrial network to be hooked up to every other computer in the universe. Um, so, you know, th that actually has uh, has consequences. And then at that point, maybe we've got gateways and so on. And it's a very different kind of network um, uh, design. But if what we're talking about is a fundamental protocol 
that is going to replace the low levels uh, or going to live alongside it or whatever it is that we're saying um, is going to happen. It's going to be a low-level protocol that's going to be general purpose uh, and presumably eventually would evolve into the replacement of existing IP and TCP and so on. Then uh, it has these very different properties. And if the network has a whole lot more control over what happens to that, that has consequences for the utility of the internet and that and it has consequences for the utility of the internet for humans uh, because it puts the control back in the power of the regulator and away from the from the edge and we should be clear about this there are definitely regulators in the world who do not like the internet because it takes the power away from the network that is definitely a position that some network uh, regulators don't you know they they don't talk about it very much, but it's very clear that that's their that's their position, and I think that that's one of the features of the internet that I really like that the 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 control of the system is really pushed towards the edge and it's pushed uh, pushed into the hands of people who can do new things with it. That's a piece that I really want to preserve, and it's one of the concerns that I have about some of the proposals that I've seen um, that are underneath uh, anything we call new IP or virtually uh, vertically integrated networks or whatever. Very good. Um, I think that that is a concern that many people share. And um, uh, however, it, it's also fair to point out that the Chinese government <clears throat> has done a pretty good job of controlling people and things uh, with the existing protocol, uh, for better or worse. Uh, let's get another question. Is there anybody else, uh, Brendan, who's uh, lining up? Don't have any more hands raised, but I have a couple of questions from the chat earlier that we could probably combine. Um, so Toralis um, asks, should the internet not be allowed to provide different services for different traffic? And relatedly, uh, Ian Brown asks, what new IP? What would new IP add uh, to InserV and DiffServ? Uh, so I saw the question from Turles, and and uh, I I I think it was directed at me. So I'll um, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll respond to that. Look, the internet already provides differential service to um, various people. Um, that's that's a fact of uh, of the way it's deployed today. Um, and sometimes that uh, is um, uh, by accident, and sometimes it's on purpose. Uh, but as Laura Donardis, who I guess has dropped off, uh, did point out. There are already plenty of use cases where you have good performance and latency and jitter um, uh, uh, commitments uh, about uh, about what the network is going to do. And if you are a party to one of those contracts, you spend plenty of your time and effort making sure that your vendor is in fact complying with what they promised you. That's that's a thing that people do. So that's already an existing uh, an existing feature of the network. The the question is more. Uh, the, the question that I would rather want to ask is whether that is a feature that we want to make a permanent part of every network, uh, and whether every network needs to um, uh, needs to do this, or whether it's a, a, a thing that we would want most networks to provide, or something like that. And that is a, a very different kind of question. And I still can't tell which side of the um, uh, of the line we're going to land on that, because that seems to me to be one of the more fundamental um, pieces of this. Part of the um, answer as to why we can't, I can't tell that, is because you know this is still in the research phases. It's not really a um, fully worked out um, protocol, never mind a standard. And so we don't actually know which thing uh, which thing we're doing. And that brings us back to this question of whether comparing a theoretical future uh, thing that hasn't been invented yet to an existing deployed thing with all the hairs all over it is uh, is a you know a fair comparison because it be, it makes it difficult. To do comparative, um, uh, you know, analyses between an actually tawdry existing thing that's deployed all over the place with all of the history uh, associated with it, and you know, a magical future technology that we haven't built yet. Um, the magical future always comes off better. Now, I'm not saying that this is a complete fairy tale. Of course, it isn't. There are real, there are real, um, real. There's real work underneath this, and I think it's commendable. But I do think it's important for us to recognize that there are consequences to the design choices that are going to be made here, and those consequences 
um, have, you know, have effects on what people can do with this technology that we've uh, managed to invent. Richard was quite correct when he started, this is maybe one of the most powerful technologies people have ever invented. And I think that, you know, we want to make sure that we don't lose many of the properties that make it so special. Um, so let me uh, try to bring things to a close here. Uh, I want to begin by saying that, um, you know, the Internet Governance Project is, <clears throat> is all about Internet governance. And uh, one of the key issues uh, we, and in my work in particular, has highlighted is this issue of the so-called fragmentation of the Internet and whether the Internet was going to break apart. And three years ago, I published a book that said, you know, the layer three compatibility of IP is so powerful that we will never fragment the Internet. Uh, but what we do see is what I called alignment in which nation states try to uh, bring control of the Internet uh, in, uh, align it with their national borders. And we have seen that happening uh, at a pace that even uh, exceeded my expectations, uh, particularly with the Trump administration and their attack on um, our connectivity to China. So the reason the new IP uh, discussion is so important is that if this decoupling, this division, this separation <clears throat> between China and the US, which of course are the two world's biggest internet economies, if this continues, uh, we very well could be looking at a technical fragmentation of the sort that I said uh, would not happen. Uh, if, if indeed one of the outcomes is that we get uh, different uh, incompatible protocols. So um, I think that this is a very important issue. I, I think that we have learned that there are fundamental principle disagreements about design, uh, particularly around the end-to-end -end argument. But I don't think we can see I, new IP as an attempt to uh, completely replace the Internet. I think uh, Richard is talking about backwards compatibility and about trying to add capabilities. Um, so with that background, let me give each of you a chance to give us a two or three minute wrap up, uh, starting with Richard. Right. So um, it's a very unfortunate idea to fragment the Internet. And I don't think it's the right way to go. And uh, personally, as I said earlier, we want to maintain the integrity of the Internet. I strongly advocate the Internet is one and only one. It should be for everyone, every person, every economy and every industry. It's for humanity, right? So, and the internet is the engine for our current economic world. Everybody benefits from it, even myself, right? You know, in that, like, last, uh, you know, so many years, like, uh, I, my job in, in this, like, uh, industry, I made routers, design routers, software, right? So, we should maintain that. No question about that, right? So, and, uh, regarding, uh, new IP, new IP will make something that's should not happen and will be very, very difficult to happen, or if not impossible. So why? Because we have some guarantee inside. And uh, if, if the router knows that, okay, if I deliver this packet to somewhere, uh, I cannot guarantee it that the router will drop it. Sorry, I cannot deliver it. Just when you send a package to FedEx, FedEx said, like, sorry, we cannot deliver it because it's in the mountain. We, you know, we, we don't have airports, right? Same thing there. So new IP make the harder and to do anything that try to interfere with the user rights. If we take a look at the new IP, new IP favors user control because the user owns the data, use the data. So we empower the end user in using the internet. Right? So there are multiple techniques inside. So today is not uh, the venue to talk about that. Hopefully, I can discuss with you and in other IEEE conferences and uh, there. Right? So and about there's no doubt. So and uh, Milton also mentioned a vertical like uh, industry here. So if suppose like uh, we have a box that can be sold to multiple like and shared and a vertical industry, that will be do good to our economy and industry for cost reduction, productivity enhancement, right? So, because, and uh, something shared, the internet, the reason internet is so successful, after one thing is that it's shared, same infrastructure is shared 
by so many people. The new IP is still the same thing. I think, and also my advice or good word, because the last lap of Andrew, Andrew has a strong position there. So my advice for you is that, is that and let IETF, ISOC, like take over the you know, new IP, standardize it, make it open and to everyone. So, so that this technology should not be like uh, just uh, people say new IP uh, in China. I have heard a question here. I understand it, the where it comes from, because in ITU, in ITU is a state sector and uh, industry sector, right? But in order to make proposal, you need to get uh, like a government's like approval. Maybe that's uh, that's the reason. Every government protects its own company. I understand it, like uh, US and other countries. I know. But uh, as a research scientist, like me here, right? So I like uh, fully like uh, promote internet as one. I do not want internet to be fragmented, to be like manyness. Manyness is a uh, is a fact. It's emerging partly because internet cannot solve their problems. So if they don't cannot solve, they define an internet. And also internet, so many years, ossification and happen, right? So, okay, so uh, and the time is running up. So hopefully I have more chances to discuss with any of you if you have more questions. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank you, Richard, for being uh, so willing to cooperate and uh, participate in this event. Andrew? Uh, thanks. I, I also want to express my thanks uh, both to you and to Richard uh, for this conversation. I think it was really good. Um, I, but I think one of the things that we've um, discovered today is a, uh, is a sort of very deep question about what it is we think we want out of network technologies. And one of the things that the Internet, uh, you know, in its creation, was responding to was this issue that there were all these different kinds of networks that had different um, sorts of properties and so on. And so you ended up with a very, very thin, very lightweight um, uh, thing, the IP and then TCP uh, and UDP and some other stuff um, that allowed them all to work together and yet do things uh, independently of one another. And this led to a natural sort of, you know, Lego block or whatever uh, sort of architecture in which, you know, various little pieces uh, work together. I think that the the concern that you're hearing from me uh, about about this is that it's impossible to tell whether what we're talking about right now is going back to that model um, where we've got sort of intercompatibility but very spe specific use cases under certain uh, circumstances, or whether this is a common network um, that um, that goes through everybody's uh, everybody's system, and those two cases have very different properties. Uh, as I saw somebody say in the in the chat, you know, it, it could be that we're heading backwards towards the old switched um, uh, uh, network uh, from, from the telephone age. And if that's the case, it's a very different, it's got very different properties than um, particular use cases um, that allow those networks to interact in a way that they can provide the guarantees that are necessary for those use cases. I think figuring that out and then figuring out which pieces of these are in fact things that everybody needs is is really the critical um, uh, feature that is still missing in the discussion about this. And if we could get that sorted, uh, we'd be a long way to figuring out which venues we need to be discussing these things in, who needs to um, uh, work on things, whether this has any implications for IP or doesn't and so on. I think that gap is the one that I'd really like to see filled. All right. Again, thank you both, uh, Andrew and Richard, for your uh, articulate uh, presentations and discussion today. And uh, let me just uh, invite the rest of our audience to um, uh, subscribe to the Internet Governance Project's uh, uh, mailing list where you get notification of these kinds of events. And uh, uh, bear in mind that uh, we are at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, and we uh, also run educational programs on um, – we have a master's degree in cybersecurity policy, and uh, you can investigate those possibilities as well. So uh, with that advertisement, I will close the event. And uh, again, thanks all for attending, and uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Milton, Andrew, for very constructive discussions. I hope, like Andrew said, many of these questions have not been discussed. I hope we have more chances. Thank you very much. Thanks.